So hello everyone. And before I get started, let me tell you that the slides are already online. So you can grab them at this link. We'll be sharing them in the chat and everywhere else. Um, yeah, the reason why I like to share them early because I have a bunch of links and examples. So if it's something catch your interest, you can have it available after the talk. With that being said, my name is Luciano and I work in Dublin uh, with a company called Fortiorem as a senior architect. I am the co-author of this book, Node.js Design Patterns, even though today we're not going to talk about Node.js, so don't worry. Uh, in any case, feel free to connect with me. I have a blog. I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me pretty much everywhere. Always happy to chat and learn more, so feel free to connect. Just a quick word about Fortiorem. If you never heard about the company, it's a remote-first company. We are specialized uh, mostly in AWS. We are AWS partners and most a uh, consulting company helping other companies to either transition to AWS or if they are already on AWS, we have been helping companies to basically improve their workloads, optimize costs, adopt serverless, all these kind of interesting things. We are also hiring. So if that's something that interests you, give me a shout after the talk. Now, quick uh, word of warning, I'm not a Rust expert by any means. It's something that I started to study in my own time in the last two years, more or less. So I'm doing that as a hobby. I haven't found yet the opportunity to use it professionally. So keep that in mind because probably I'm going to say a bunch of stupid things or not accurate things. So keep that in mind. Uh, things that I'm doing to, to learn Rust as a hobby, I'm doing live streams every Monday with two friends of mine, Eugen and Roberto. So if it's something that interests you, we're trying to solve Advent of Code. Yesterday, we tried to do that on a Raspberry Pico. So we are experimenting even with Rust on bare metal. So maybe check out the Twitch channel or the recordings on YouTube. I also wrote a few articles, very basic stuff. So if you're curious to find out, you can check them out. Actually, the last one there, I think it's still relevant, even if it says 2021. I think it was my one of my most successful articles. It's basically a collection of all the learning resources that I found so far. Uh, I also publish a few very simple crates. JWT Info is actually something I presented at this meetup in one of the lightning talks of last year. But I have a few more. And the last one, DGC, is the COVID certificate one that we are going to be discussing today. OK, without further ado, let's get started. Full disclaimer, I'm not involved with the working group that created the specification uh, around the, the Green Pass. It's just something that I was curious about, and I started to, to look deeper and learn more and more. But probably I'm going to be missing a few important details. So this is just my view about what I understood by, by researching it autonomously. Other disclaimer is that I know that COVID has been tough on everyone. So let's, let's forget we are talking about COVID. Let's just talk about the technology behind the, the certificate. So the agenda for today is to try to understand why do we need this kind of certificate? What is the cryptographic model behind it? What kind of data is inside a certificate? All the different layers of encoding, and that's probably the most interesting part. And finally, we are gonna try to scratch a super quick and dirty decoder in Rust. If we have extra time, I'm gonna try to also show you a few interesting things in the actual library. So we're not gonna, of course, reproduce the entire library because that, that has so many features and so much more code. We're gonna do something like in about 50 lines of code, but then we're gonna look some of the interesting learnings that I got from this project in Rust. So again, the goal is to learn some new interesting technologies, learn a little bit of Rust and just have fun. So what's the need? Why do we need this kind of certificate? And the, the reason is that we need a simple system to quickly provide a proof against COVID. And that can be proof of vaccination, proof of negative test, or proof of recovery. And it needs to be personal, easy to carry around, so possibly also available in both digital and print format, but also should be very easy to issue and validate because we needed to generate thousands or millions of them in a very short period of time. And the other thing, and this is probably the most important part, it needs to be secure against forgery and it needs to work across country, pretty much around Europe, but there are also other countries that adopt the same 
standard. So this is kind of the specification and there is a link there if you're really curious to, to look at all the details, but I'm gonna to try to summarize uh, what are the most important parts. So the first thing that there are some guiding principles that, that, that were used to define this specification. The first thing is that there is data that needs to be machine readable and this data is signed. It needs to use compact encoding and the reason why is because there is a lot of information in a QR code. And we know that if you put too much information in a QR code, it becomes very dense and it becomes harder and harder to scan. So the idea is that try to find a balance that allows us to pack as much information as possible without degrading too much the QR code and making it harder to scan. And the other interesting thing is that the commission, the, the committee that tried to define the standard, they, they thought, okay, let's try to use as much as possible open standards. Let's not try to reinvent the wheel. And I suppose because it's a good practice, but also because time constraints were really pushy. So first of all, let me explain very quickly what is the asymmetric cryptographic signatures that are used in the uh, green pass. You probably know this, but I just want to give you a super quick recap just in case. So the idea is that there are two keys, one private key and a public key. And basically there is a document. In this case, you can imagine the QR code itself is a document. And somebody that has the private key can sign that document using the private key. At that point, anyone that knows the public key and it's called public because anyone should have access to that key, can use that key to check the integrity of that document. They can check basically using the public key that the document was actually signed using the private key, which basically tells us that that trusted authority, that owner is actually being verified as somebody that signed that document. So what's inside a certificate? There is a lot of information, I already said that, but this information is structured and there are a number of layers. So the first thing that we have is a cryptographic header, which is basically something that tells us a unique ID for this particular, for the key that was actually used to sign it, to sign the certificate and the particular algorithm that was used for the cryptographic signature. And we'll see that there are different types of algorithms that are supported. Then there is this DGC container, which is actually where we're gonna find all the interesting data. And finally, there is the actual signature itself. So pretty much we have in the header, we learn what is the key and what is the algorithm. Then there is the entire content. And finally, we have the signature that signs all the content. But what's the content? We have another header inside and that header is used to define who issued this certificate, when it was issued and when it's gonna expire. And finally, we have all the data regarding the, the person itself, but also the, the um, um, for instance, the name, the surname, the date of birth, but also the certificate list, which is, for instance, is it a vaccine, is it a test, or is it a recovery? In theory, there could be more than one in the same certificate. In practice, this feature was never used. We always have one certificate, one proof, either vaccine, test, or recovery. Let's take an example. So this is how a valid uh, QR code is gonna look like. You can actually scan it using one of the applications. Probably it's gonna tell you that it's not valid because this is a test certificate. So it's not gonna be using one of the signatures that uh, are available uh, by issued by the county, so the official ones, but there is data that you can actually read. And this is the data that you will find out if you actually try to scan this QR code and you know exactly how to read this data. So we are gonna to try to figure out how to get from what you see on the left side, so a QR code to what you see on the right side. And as you can see, there are some parts that pretty much are the ones we just described in the previous slide. So there is a DG DGC header and it's very hard to tell here, but basically there is an issue which is the DK and that means Denmark. And then we have a couple of dates uh, that represents when it was issued and when it's gonna expire. Then there is personal information. And then there is an array of certificates. In this particular case is a vaccination certificate. So you get all the information related to a vaccination proof. 
Now, the going from the QR code to this data is not one step process. There are many layers that we need to explore. We need to decode basically through many layers before we get to the actual information. So the first layer is the QR code itself. Then once you read the QR code in ASCII, you basically have a prefix and some piece of data encoded in base 45. We'll talk more about that. Then there is a layer of compression. Then there is another layer of, um, uh, it's like a container that allows you to sign data and data that is uh, uh, saved in this particular encoding format that is called CBOR. And again, we are gonna talk about all these uh, technologies here. Okay, let's start with the first layer. So if we just scan the QR code, what do we see in plain text? We'll see something like this. And there is a prefix, which is always H, C, one and column. And this prefix basically tells us this is actually a certificate following this particular specification. Then everything else is just binary data encoded in base 45. Now, what the hell is base 45? We all know base 64, what is base 45? And is of course something very similar, but rather than using 64 characters, it uses 45. And the reason why 45 rather than 64 is because they did some empirical tests and realized that they compress better using Zlib and then in, in a QR code that the result is better than just using base 64. Uh, so the, the idea is that if you have some arbitrary binary data, you can visualize, for instance, if you know it's a string, maybe it's UDF8. If it's an index, you can visualize the data this way. If it's base 64, it's going to look something like this. If it's base 45, it's going to look like this. So basically, base 45 is just one of the many ways that you can have to represent arbitrary binary data as a string. Okay, so if we try to decode this content from base 45 using a base 45 decoder, what do we get as raw binary data? We are going to see something that looks more or less like this. And of course, we need some X viewer to view the data because it's binary. And this data doesn't make a lot of sense. And the reason why is because it's just compressed data. And the data was compressed using the Zlib standard. I'm not going to spend too much time. It's just one of the many open source Zlib compression algorithms. Uh, interesting thing is that if we go from here and we use the Zlib inflate, which is basically the decompression function in Zlib, we end up with something like this. And here it starts to get a little bit more interesting because if we zoom in, we can start to see some sort of readable data. You can see something like Danish health data authority in there. You can see something that looks like a name. So this is starting to become a little bit readable. Now, what do we need to do to actually read it in a structured format? We need to understand the next two layers. And the next layer is this specification called COSE or CWT, which is effectively a standard that allows us to take a document, a structured object if you want and sign it and this uses uh, another specification another encoding format which is called CBOR so we need to talk about CBOR first to understand CWT and uh, the signature algorithm there what is CBOR it's pretty much like JSON but in binary so in JSON we have different data types and the, the data can be nested for instance, you have this generic concept of a value and a value can be one of these different types. And if you look, for instance, at array, array can have mixed values or meaning values of different types. They can also contain other subarrays or they could even contain objects. Similarly for an object, you can have strings, you can have arrays, you can have nested objects. You use JSON all, all the time, right? So you know how it works. And CBOR is pretty much the same, except that rather than being in plain text is in binary. So if we try to visualize all the different types as X, this is how they would look like. So this is literally the same information we are seeing here in CBOR will look like this. 
There are a couple of interesting differences. For instance, string is actually called text and it needs to be valid UTF-8. Then objects are called map. And then there is also the, the possibility to uh, extend Cbor uh, by providing tags. So you could say, I'm going to define a custom type, for instance, I don't know, a timestamp. And you could specify a prefix that a binary code that identify your custom type. And then you can encode that using, for instance, a byte string. And this is something that the specification uses. So that, that's why I wanted to mention. Let's look at a very quick example. So you have always you start with a tag and the tag will define the type of value. So in this case, A3 means there is an object and this object contains three properties. Then we start to look at the first property. And we know that as an object, a property will be key value pairs. So the first value that um, six three pretty much is another tag that says this is a string and the length is three. And basically we can follow, I'm not gonna describe all the standard, but you can get the idea of how this is encoded and you can progressively reconstruct the object and decode it this way. And in this case, for instance, we have an array of three elements. The elements are one, two, and three, then another string, which is another key, and then another value, which in this case, another object with zero uh, attributes or zero key value pairs. Now that we understand more or less what CBOR is, what is the standard COSE or CWT? It's, uh, um, again, uh, a way to sign objects that are encoded using this CBOR specification. If you ever looked into JWT or JOSE, it's pretty much the same idea, except that rather than using JSON objects, it uses this CBOR specification underneath. But the idea is that you, you can use it to either encrypt data or sign data, or even to do MAC uh, over data. Now we only care about the signing part because this is the one that is being used in the, the, the green pass. And as I said, it's like JWT. So you have a protocol that allows you to say, if I'm going to give you an object that is specified as a CBOR, you can trust that I actually generate this object because there is a signature and you can validate that signature. Now, the interesting part that is going to become useful when we try to implement this is that a CWT has four different parts. There is protected header, non-protected header, a payload, and a signature. So because it's using CBOR as a representation format, it, this is literally a CBOR object where the protected header is the first element and it's a binary string. Then we have non-protected header, which is just a plain map. Then there is the payload and this can be anything. And in real life, this is actually another CBOR embedded into it as a binary string. So you will need to basically double decode this object if you want. And then finally, this is the, the signature, which is just a sequence of bytes, which uh, are encoded as a binary string. Okay, let's try to make a little bit more sense of what I just said with an example. So if we look at our current layer, so we are here, what we see is that we start with this D2. And D2 is a special tag that says, this is a CWT object. Then there is another tag that says, okay, this is an array and an array made of four parts. And we say that a CBOR CWT is made of four different items. These items are effectively items of an array. Then we start with the first one, and this is the protected header. And we say that protected header is just a binary string. Then we have the unprotected header, which is a map object. In this case, it's empty. By the way, I haven't seen this used a lot in the case of the green pass. It's something that is in the specification, but most of the time will be an empty object. Finally, we have the payload, and this is where all the information lives, and it's a binary string. And finally, we have the signature, which is what we can use to actually validate that this particular certificate is authentic. Now, if we zoom in in the payload, 
we say that this is pretty much another encoded CBOR object. So we can read this again as a CBOR object. So the first part is a tag that literally tells us, okay, this is a CBOR encoded nested sub object. And then if we try to decode it using the algorithm that we briefly described before, we actually finally get to the data that we saw at the beginning. So at this point, we should have a clear idea of what are all the layers and what we should be doing to actually decode a green bus. The first thing we need to do is remove that HC1 prefix because that, that's just telling us this is the specification, this is the format, that we can just remove it. The remaining data is encoded in base 45, so we need to take that string and decode it. We end up with a binary payload. We know that the payload is uh, compressed using Zlib, so we can use the inflate function to basically decompress all that binary string. Then we know the resulting object will be a CWT document, so we should be able to read it using CBOR and understanding the four different parts that are inside of it. And at that point, we can just extrapolate the payload, decode it again using CBOR, and that's all the readable information that it's saved inside a green bus. At that point, we can party. Now let's try to implement all of this using Rust. So let's do a new library. We are just gonna call it DGC decode. And at this point, we can start with this template. So I already put there um, the same uh, green pass that we saw before in the example as a string. So we are not going to uh, read the QR code. We are gonna be starting from the next step where we already have the information inside the QR code. How do we decode from there? And we have the five steps. So let's start with the first step. In the first step, we just need to remove that HC1 uh, column prefix. So this is gonna be easy enough because this is just string manipulation at this point, right? So let's do a function for it. And in this function, what we can do is literally saying, okay, if the string is less than four characters or four bytes or four, I guess, UTF-8 characters, uh, just panic because that, that's not a valid one. Otherwise, what we need to do is just return the slice from the uh, fifth character on. So from the character number four to the end of the string. And this is enough to just remove uh, that HC1 prefix. So the next step is we know that the remaining string, so what we return from our previous function after we remove the prefix is all information uh, encoded in base 45. So we need to be able to decode base 45. Let's create a function for it and let's implement it. Of course, we are not gonna implement a full decoder for base 45. There are libraries for that. So we are just gonna install a library. And at this point, our job becomes very easy. Like we just need to say, take the data and decode it that can fail. For now, we are just gonna unwrap. We are gonna assume that our data is clean and we trust that it's not gonna fail. Okay, next step, once we decode the data, we know that the resulting information is a compressed um, binary string. So we need to decompress it. Again, let's do it. We have a function for it. And we are not going to write a Zlib uh, implementation to, to decompress data. So we're going to use a library. And there is this cool library called inflate. And with that library, we pretty much, again, just do one liner. We say inflate by Zlib. We pass the slides, the slice, and we can unwrap because, again, we are not doing any type of error handling. We are assuming our data is clean. And we just return the resulting. Uh, byte string. Here it might be interesting to see that we are returning a vector of U8, which is generally what I've seen that the most standard way to represent binary data in, in Rust. 
okay, at this point, we might wonder, are we on the right track? How do we know that? So these are all the steps that we implemented. So we can remove the prefix, we can decode base 45, we can decompress. We know that at this point, if we try to visualize our data, we should see something readable. Now, Rust is actually very interesting because uh, you cannot just print a string if it's not proper UTF-8. So if you really want to do that, you need to use this string from UTF-8 lossy, which is gonna replace all the involved UDFA characters with this question mark that you see there in the output. So this is an interesting thing in Rust that you cannot just print arbitrary strings. They need to be UDFA compliant or you need to do this kind of loss sitting yourself. In other languages, you just get the, the question marks out of the box. In Rust, it will actually panic if you try to do this without uh, explicitly using this lossy variation. Now, you can see here that we already start to see that readable information that we saw before. So probably we are on the right track. You can see Danish health data authority and so on. Okay, so the next step is probably one of the most interesting at this point. We need to read that content and we know that content is encoded as CBOR and that it's a specific uh, type of object which follows that CWT specification. So we do this function called get CWT payload, but surprise, we need to use a library to read CBOR because implementing all of that will probably take days on its own. So it's better to use a library. This library is actually pretty good. I really like it. It's very simple, but has all the features that you might need. And uh, it's also very cool because it allows you to do, um, you can use it either with Serdi if you already know the, the, the structure of the object you want to, to decode. But if you don't know it, you can just use generic values and figure it out as you go. Here, we are going to pretend we don't know the structure. So we are going to deserialize to a generic value. Sorry. You can see here in line 14 that uh, you can use this function called from reader we can pass our data as a slice, and that is gonna give us a generic CBOR value. And a CBOR value, you can just print it in the bug mode and it will show you the structure, but you can also use the match operator because value is just an enum. If you really want to see, is this an object? Is this an array? Is this an integer? And so on. So if we try to print it, actually what we get is interesting. Let's zoom into that because what we see is just the structure. So we see that the first thing is a tag, which is 18. And this is the special tag that tells us this is a CWT object. Then we have an array and we know that we should find four different elements in this array. The first is a byte sequence and it's the protected header. Then we have the empty map, which uh, generally is the non-protected header. Then we have the actual payload, which is the part we are interested into. And finally, we have the signature. Now, in this function, we only want to retard the payload. So what we do, we parse. We make sure that the tag is actually 18, because if it's not 18, this is not the kind of object we should actually deal with. If it's 18, we can pretty much trust that the structure is OK, and we can just take the second part, which is the payload, and return it. Now, we want to own that uh, return information. So we do a clone and we get back a vector of U8. Okay, at this point, we are very close. Then we managed to get the payload. The last step that we need to do is to actually parse that payload. And to parse that payload, we create our own function. And what we want to do is, again, we know that that payload is going to be another CBOR information. So we can keep using the same library. We can keep using from reader here and get a value that way. And this is going to be a generic CBOR value. And at this point, if you try to print a generic CBOR value in the bug mode, what you get is something like this. So you'll get something readable that looks like the structure we, we were trying to represent in the first place. 
Now, this is not super readable because it's there is a lot of nesting there and it's very hard to make sense of the information. So it's nice, but we can make it a little bit more readable. And the cool thing, as I said, is that this Ciborium library works very well with Cerdi and Cerdi allows you to easily convert things between different types of serialization that supports. So we have Cibor, Cerdi also supports JSON, so we can easily transpose this Cibor data structure into a JSON data structure. And to do that, what we can do is basically import this library and then we can just say to string pretty and that will do all the magic for us. And now we finally get the data in, in JSON format. Cool. So if you want to see all the code that we discussed today, it will be at this link. But in reality, the real library is this one. So what we did is just a simplified version of the library. The library does a lot more. And the library also contains all the different data structure, for instance, to represent all the data that's inside a vaccine, that's inside a proof of uh, um, um, recovery or uh, negative test. And all of them will have slightly different data structures. So the library also gives you ways to, to use that information with proper types. Uh, an exercise that if you have time, you can try to do is how do we actually validate that the signature is okay? Like right now we just took whatever was the test um, certificate, which we know is not actually valid. If you try to scan it, it's gonna tell you this is not a valid one because it's not using a, a production signature, it's just using test signatures. But if you want to try to scan your own certificate and validate that is actually fine, how do you do that? So the first issue is that we don't know where the public keys are. And there is a link there where you can try to figure out exactly where to find the public keys. Every country has a slightly different way of storing them, but there are also repositories where people actually unified all of them and you can find snapshots that are daily created with all the available public signatures. Uh, then we need to really understand how the protocol works and what are the different types of algorithms that are supported in terms of uh, public, private uh, uh, key cryptography. And you could use a crate to, at that point to do the actual validation. Uh, and one of the ones that I saw, and I think it's the one that we, we ended up using in the library is Ring, which supports a very good variety of cryptography algorithms. Okay, one question that you might have at this point, is all this stuff legal? Yes and no, I guess is the answer, meaning that you can definitely look into your own, your own certificate. And of course, nobody is going to tell you that you are violating somebody else's private information. But if you start to look into other people's certificates, you might want to be careful. So if you are creating some sort of integration, maybe for a platform or something like that, where you need, for instance, to validate that a certificate is valid before allowing people to do something, it, it's a very sensitive topic because you are actually reading sensitive information about people. So are you storing this information? How long are you keeping it in your system? All this stuff, there is regulation and it's different in every country. So be careful on, on with that. So this is a fun exercise, but if you really want to bring it to production, there might be legal implications that you might want to consider. Okay, and this is all I have, but I also want to show you some of the actual code, but probably it's better to, to try to see if there are questions first and answer those. Uh, what do you think, Anton and Alan? Yeah, go for it. There was a couple of questions that flew up in the um, channel there. So if anybody just wants to unmute and fire some questions at Luciano. Yeah. Okay, let me let me go then. Let me go. So he was saying, did you it's on the chat up? So have you used uh, Cerdi Seabor? I did use it initially, but then I realized it was very unmaintained. It was I think the last uh, update was like three or four years ago. Mm. And I found Seaborium to be uh, much more up to date. The community was very responsive. I even did a PR and they were very helpful. So I think it has all the features that I saw in um, 
Cibor Serdi or Serdi Cibor. But yeah, it's a little bit more up to date. Cool. And the question I had while I'm just going through this, um, did what do you what tools did you use for splunking around and decoding? Do we just what type of hex editors were you using and all that sort of good stuff? Yeah, so there is a pretty good documentation on GitHub. So actually, I, I was impressed by seeing how open this entire process was. Mm -hmm. And you can find all the conversation that these people have on GitHub as issues. So I was pretty impressed how in such a short amount of time, there was this European committee working together and they managed to build something that I think is actually doing a good job and it's well documented and all. So there, there are also a couple of examples in Python and I think in JavaScript as well. And then they also link other libraries in all sorts of languages that people have written. So I was kind of just looking around and finding different ways to really understand what were the different layers and how to decode all of them. So in terms of X editor, the one I used here, I don't even remember the name, but it's like a pretty standard one for Mac OS. Uh, is it called X or something like that? I'm not really sure, but I can dig it out and, and let you know. Yeah, so you weren't really, really so, I guess my question was, or is, you you found it handy enough to just go through the specs, look at the example, and you didn't really have to unpick it, sort of what yeah. you found. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting then to see some of the details of how Cibor really works, but then at the end of the day, I used a library for it because I didn't want to implement like all the different protocols, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's not even saying the name. Okay, I I'll dig it later if you're curious. But yeah, it's a pretty standard one. Did they go into any detail about the, the gains from base 45 over base 64? Uh, I think it's something that you can find on GitHub. There are a few interesting things though. I didn't try to do any benchmark myself. But there are some interesting things. For instance, uh, there is a conversation where somebody is proving to them that that Zlib compression is actually ineffective. It's actually adding a few bytes rather than compressing. But th there is a, an entire story that I managed to dig through the, the GitHub repository, where basically they say, OK, at, at the beginning, one of the pillars of the specification was that you will be able to store all your entire history in one certificate. So in one certificate, you would effectively have multiple proofs like vaccination, how many doses, if you did tests and so on. So they expected the square code to, to be much bigger. And in those cases, the compression would be much more effective. In reality, I'm not really sure why every country decided to go with just one certificate, one proof. And then there is a much smaller amount of data. And at that point, the, the compression doesn't make sense. But because the compression, I don't think it's optional or something you can flag and say, this is compressed or not. Like the standard is like you compress it anyway and it doesn't matter if you are saving a few bytes or gaining three or four extra bytes. So right. the, there could be done some benchmark and this can be optimized even more, but I think, yeah, it's a project that was done quite in a rush, so actually. And so our certs should be kind of an array of vaccinations or, and instead what they do is they just reissue one every time. Exactly. So you can oh, see here that, the, um, uh, let me go through it. I think a few slides back. There you can see that this uh, V basically means uh, this is the array of like validations, but here you could have different things. Like you, you have one year, but there could be multiple ones. Makes sense. In reality, you will always find one because I, I don't know of any country that actually used this array for more than one value. And there was no reason, like no comments that kind of alluded to why they all chose the same as Hartley by chance. <laughs> Maybe it was simpler. I, I don't know. I couldn't find any explanation. It's bad documentation somewhere, maybe. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Or maybe they, they were worried that the QR code will become unreadable because maybe it will become too dense and then harder to, to scan. Maybe that, that, that could be another reason. Right. Um, David had another question here. Um, how much data can you stick into the QR code of that size? 
Oh yeah, I don't know in terms of bytes. We could probably check how big. I mean, if we just check how big is this string here uh, in the next few slides, that should be the answer, right? Because this is how much data we, we, we are storing for this QR code exactly. But if they had implemented it in a, in a, in a list, or some of the check, um, then it's, it's probably more the limit of the QR code than anything else, how much data you can store there. And as you say, the, whatever's reading it. Yeah, I don't know if there is an upper limit. I think the QR code will keep scaling down. It's like, you can see here, this is like a cube then there is another cube and there is another cube. I think it will get more and more dense. There might be an upper limit for sure because it's not a format meant to store like a huge amount of data. But you, you can make it more and more dense if you really want to stretch it. It could be interesting to find out what is the limit if there is one. Okay, and Ernest is just asking, were there any or are there any plans to incorporate um, ZKP into this application to help with privacy? I have no idea what ZKP is. Neither do I. <laughs> so let's do it. So, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear hey, me? Ernest. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was just referring to zero knowledge proofs. Okay. Zero knowledge I, proof. I might not know what that is either. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a, it's a branch of cryptography that allows you to prove something without um, revealing um, anything about it. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a component of homomorphic encryption inside there. And I mean, a little bit of a disclaimer, I know like there was a prototype um, and some people working on a POC with IBM to create a vaccine passport, which for example, just proves that you're vaccinated or not without having to reveal anything about you in terms of your date of birth, your age, your sex right. or anything like that. And using zero knowledge proof cryptography, that's how you would do that basically. So you create an identity object, which is obfuscated using homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. And then it allows the kind of mask the properties and reveal and only prove what you need to prove um, mm -hmm. via the, the yeah via, via the commit basically yeah one interesting thing that i didn't mention that maybe is relevant to this question is that if you look at the spec they really thought about this but the usage of this particular certificate as in you'll be able to see some personal identifiable information like i don't know name and date of birth mm. And then somebody needs to come to you if you are an authority trying to verify the certificate with a proof of identity, some sort of, I don't know, personal ID and the mm. certificate. And then you, you need to match the two because one of the common attacks that at this point, I think everybody knows is that you get somebody else's certificate and you go around with that. So if nobody's looking for a match between that certificate and your own personal documents, then the whole system that doesn't work anymore. Now, maybe with uh, zero, zero knowledge, um, you could do something around that, but I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know that well enough. Interesting. Okay, that's really cool. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Very, very interesting question. I'm going to try to find out more about Please, that I would topic. love to send you some stuff on that. I would definitely love to send you some stuff on that. Please do, yeah, thanks. Quite a bit of that actually is uh, the work for that's done in Dublin. So on the digital health pass, it's done in Mulhudded with IBM. Nice. I didn't know that. Need to, need to get another speaker. Speaker plan there. See if they're doing anything rust up there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a lady called Mary Wallace who heads that up. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're sharing favourite hex editors here. <laughs> um, 010 is Matt Davis's favourite hex editor. Awesome. Um, By the way, if there is extra time, there are a couple of interesting things that I learned from this project that I would like to share from Rust itself, like as a language. But only before you, just before time. you jump in, yeah, no, absolutely. Just before you jump in, uh, did we talk about the benchmark? Did you benchmark this in terms of performance? No, so no. Easy answer. <laughs> yeah, David always, David always asks the difficult ones there. <laughs> I think it's probably bottlenecked by your camera more than anything else. Yeah, in theory, as far as I understand, the, the choice of the open source technologies was done to basically favor even like 
pure, pure hardware implementation. So this should be as lightweight as possible, but I didn't do any benchmark. So I'm going to take the spec at face value. Okay. Okay, you're so, going to dive into something. Eh? Yeah. So a couple of so first of all, one cool thing about this library is that I just did it as my own like project for fun, and then I had the opportunity to do this talk at Code Motion, so that that was also interesting and another excuse to to dig deeper and build all the slides. But while I was preparing the slides, somebody reached out to me because they saw this project on GitHub by chance, I have no idea how, because I didn't even promote it that much. And uh, it was basically somebody representing a group called Rust Italy. So it's basically a, like a meetup in Italy where they, they discuss about Rust, but they also try to do open source projects and they have a, an organization on GitHub. And they basically said, oh, we wanted to do something around uh, the code in the Green Pass. And we saw that you already created this library. Why don't we join forces and do this together? And it was pretty cool for me because those are people that actually use Rust at work every day. So they definitely know way more than I do. And they were basically coming in say, okay, you did this thing, this is wrong, or at least this can be done better. So some of the things I wanted to share are pretty much coming from that review and trying to, to make the project a little bit better. So at the end of the day, it was a great excuse for me to, to get some professional review and get to learn something new. So the first interesting thing is um, the idea of workspaces, uh, which basically it's an interesting feature from Cargo that I wish many other systems would have out of the box. Uh, but basically it allows you to, to use one single repository as a monorepo out of the box. Like it's already built in in Cargo. You don't need to bring any other tool. And the reason why is because that, DGC library is kind of generic and works for all Europe and like it's the basic standard. In reality, every other country ended up implementing something on top of the specification. So in reality, there is like an additional layer that is bespoke for every country. And these guys wanted to try to get this library approved by the Italian government as the recommended library if you were to do any integration in Italy. So they, they, they were asked by the Italian government to also implement this additional layer. And it was very interesting to see all this conversation where I was sitting there in a corner because I, I didn't have the expertise to engage there, but where they basically decided, okay, we're gonna keep this as a pure layer that is only implementing like the base standard. And then we're gonna create an additional crate that uses this other layer as a dependency that is specific only for the Italian use cases, adding all the additional functionality. So they decided to use this idea of workspace, which is extremely simple. So it's amazing how well it works. You have a cargo tomel, but it's different from the usual cargo tomel you will see in every project because it just says, this is a workspace and these are all the sub projects. You literally have to just mention the subfolders. And then in every subfolder, it's literally a standard Rust project. So this is like a proper usual cargo tomel and in the other one we have another one and the interesting thing is that at that point you can uh, build them and it, they will respect the dependencies but also you can build your own for instance github actions to publish the two libraries independently so this was one very cool thing that i learned and it's something that then i started to use myself in the uh, advent of code in rust where every exercise is literally like a sub project. So I can work on individual exercises and run the tests, but from the outside, you can also just run cargo tests and it will automatically run the test for every single workspace. And it's actually doing even that in parallel. So it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's impressive how little it gets in the way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was already built in as a feature and it's something that for instance, in yeah. the Node.js ecosystem, you don't get by default in NPM. <laughs> Yarn uh, something around that, but doesn't yeah. work well with NPM. So it's kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a deliberate choice. Can, can you guys hear me at all? Yes. Uh, it's actually a little bit better than that. Uh, with Cargo Workspaces, if you had multiple projects and one of them was a uh, binary and all the rest were libs, Cargo Run will actually find 
the binary and run it for you. It, nice. it's even better than that, if you have multiple libraries and with examples, you can just do cargo run uh, hyphen hyphen example as normal, and mm -hmm. it will search through all the um, sub um, workspaces, sub projects, and run it for you. So it's going to run all the examples in that case? Yeah, so for example, say, 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 say there's an example called Foo in, in one of the projects called Bar. Um, oh, right. Uh, so by, by doing example Foo, it will find it in Bar and then run it um, from that. So you don't have to go into the Bar directory and then run it locally. I didn't know that. And this is something we do here. We have examples. And I was always going inside the folder and run cargo, run example. So great thing to know. Yeah, give it a go. Thank you for sharing that. OK, then the last thing I want to show you is another interesting feature that, uh, let me see if I can find the documentation here. So what, one interesting thing is that there is this concept of value sets that I didn't explain during the presentation. Let me make this a little bit bigger because I see people squinting. <laughs> but basically, the idea is that, of course, because we want to keep everything as compact as possible, for instance, if we have to say, I don't know, Denmark, we say DK rather than say Denmark as extended. But also there are codes, for instance, for diseases, like COVID-19 is actually codified with this number or this string or uh, different types of tests have their own codes or different types of vaccines have their own code. So th there is this concept that you could use an official value set to expand these IDs into more descriptive representations of the values. And this is something that we wanted to include in the library. So once you get an object decoded, you can just say, look up values or expand all the values. So, so you can look up one by one or you can even expand the entire object and, and get all the values in a more descriptive way, which is great if you're doing debugging, it will give you a much more descriptive object rather than all these codes that possibly you don't know exactly what they mean. So I implemented this thing in a very bad way at the beginning. Let me see if I can find the PR. Yes, that's it. So all this red code is what the, the expert guys removed. But basically I was doing, okay, I'm just gonna do a lazy static. I'm just gonna create like a huge hash map. And then basically I have key value pairs that I can use for the lookup. And of course, this is a terrible idea. I didn't know any better at the time. And the better idea is that you can just use a match statement at that point, because this is so static that it's gonna end up in your code anyway. Why do you need to allocate it in the stack every time you run the, the, the system, right? You can just do a match as you go. And that that's pretty much more efficient. It's not doing any allocation. It's just using the, um, the, the static uh, strings that are already in the binary basically for you. Sorry if I'm not describing this in the most accurate way, but I, I hope that you're getting the point. And also that I, if I didn't understand it correctly, please feel free to, to correct me. I wonder if there's a macro that can take, say, a JSON file at compile time and generate this. Oh, that could be an interesting one. I'm not aware, but I can see some good use cases. Definitely there is one here. I know there is a library that uh, statically builds an object out of like this sort of map and compiles it in, but I don't remember the name. OK, something interesting maybe to, to, to research a little bit and see. Because yeah, this can be a common enough use case, I guess. Every time you have this kind of table, association table, you, you probably need to do something like this. And then there is another interesting uh, advanced way of seeing this. Let me see if I can get a decent, like there is a version two of this implementation. So I, of course I was using strings everywhere because it was easier for me to deal with string and not str. And the more experienced guys came in and said, no, 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 you don't use strings like that. Like you need to be careful. You, you should avoid allocations as much as possible. And they suggested to use the, the idea of clone on write so that basically, uh, because you, you could build your own object from scratch and you don't really know where the data is coming from. String was like the most generic representation I could think of. 
But then in reality, most of the time you have static strings because all these values are pre-encoded. So you can just reference them, right? So they basically explained me that you can use a clone on write as a way to say, every time you can use an STR, this is gonna be an STR. If you really need to use a string because you are doing something a little bit more custom and you are manipulating data more dynamically, then this will be a string. So clone on write, if you look at this documentation, is basically nothing less than an enum where you can have either like a borrow variant, which is going to be in the case of uh, str, str, or an own variant, which is going to be a string. But you can use this also for, for instance, for slices, sorry, for arrays and vectors. So the, the next version of this thing is actually using uh, clone on write everywhere to, to try to make the code more generic. And then there is there was another PR that basically removed all the usages of strings with uh, clone on write enums. So yeah, I wanted to share this stuff because for me it was very fascinating. And, and I don't know what's the audience like, but if you are learning Rust, all this concept to me are a bit unique. Like I, I, I didn't have exposure to other low level languages, generally used mostly interpreted languages like JavaScript and Python. So learning all these things was pretty interesting and a lot of these things were unexpected. That's all I have. And Tom, my battery's about to go. Could you man the fort there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, Luciano. Thank you. So really appreciate that. Thanks and some great questions there from everybody. Um, sorry, you can probably see my finger now as I'm tapping mm -hmm. around the screen. I uh, just want to make sure we've covered off the chat. And thanks everybody for the links as well. I'm going to try and um, just ask Alan to try and uh, get some of the links out of the chat so we can put them in the meetup group. And um, people, Matt, you're, you're lining up for a talk here. If you're doing blog posts on strings and um, copy on rights, then that has, there has to be a talk in there somewhere, surely. I'll hit you up about it. Um, a good idea. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> it, it, it me will probably persuade me to do a talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, metaphorically, uh, honestly. I'll metaphorically do a talk then. <laughs> Touche. Touche. Yeah, okay. So cheers. Thanks to the channel for putting the slides in.